broadcasting live out of a basement in Appleton, Wisconsin. You're tuned into Fox City's Core on WCZR Code Zero Radio. We're the show that gives you an opportunity to call in and be a part of the show. Our call in line is 920-358-0795. Core. My next guest started in the Green Bay music scene as the frontman for the early 80s band No Response. He's worked in the music industry for over two decades, notably as the tour manager for such acts as Collective Soul, The Replacements, and The Black Keys. He recently started uploading videos to his YouTube channel, focusing on his career and his battle with Parkinson's. I'd like to welcome Jim Rungy to Fox City's Core on WCZR. How are you doing, Jim? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. And you've been involved in the scene for a long time. I mean, I guess you got your start in the, the Green Bay scene. Was it the early 80s? Yeah, I mean, we put on the first shows at Northside, which were the first um, punk shows in the 80s. There was an earlier group that in the late 70s, um, late 70s that was doing shows, but I think we were the most hard, they were more like punk cover bands and and more like English punk bands, but we were the first, like, we did the hardcore scene and we did the first shows at Northside Bowling Lanes in um, in. 1983 i think was when we did our did our first shows and you had a an interest in music pretty early i'm guessing when you were getting the your first band together the punk scene in green bay was almost non-existent at that point yeah i mean there was a there was a small one i mean i discovered punk in 1978 so there was a a small group of the, the miners the tyrants and in milton the pop tarts and there was a small group, like I said, mainly doing covers, um, punk covers, and playing in bars. A lot of it was in bars. There was a game room across from West High School that that they showed. In fact, there, I don't know if you did the documentary Green Blah, there, there which has been working on for ten years, I think. Um, that kind of covers that whole era of the Northside Bowling Lanes up through like cuts. Because I, I I I was kind of booking the north side stuff and then we we discovered Kutzkas, and that's kind of when i bowed out and moved moved to moved to minneapolis full-time in the in the mid early mid mid 80s so when the, the shows at Kutzkas, obviously were, were you already in minneapolis when the the famous face-to-face show at Kutzkas? yeah <laughs> i was long, i was long gone by then i did the early-ish couple of years i was i owned a record store in green bay from 80 I moved to Minneapolis in the 85, came back to open a record store in 87, and then 89 moved to moved, moved to Minneapolis full time, and then really didn't come back for like 20 years, kind of just kind of traveled and only you know, came back for Christmases and didn't really see anything. So it's only in the last um, 15, 10, 15 years that I've been coming back and then moved back here five, six years ago. So during that time, were you keeping in touch with some of your friends that were in the, the Green Bay scene? I was and I wasn't. I, I did. There's a couple of people that I did, and I, 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 I watched. Um, I kind of kept track of things through social media, which, which was just starting to, to happen. But um, it kind of developed its own, like a, the Concert Cafe era, Green Bay punk, I like completely missed. I think I, I came back for Christmas and did one walk through to check it out. That was, that was it. That was the only time I um, I ever went there. I never saw a show there or anything. So did were you friends with Time Bomb Tom before you left, or did you oh, meet yeah. him later? Yeah, no, I've known I've known Tom since he was a little metal kid. Have him, <laughs> um, yeah, we go we go way back. I know I've known him. And Norb and Norb and I kind of grew up together. We were it was me him. Um, Gary, who was in suburban relation with Norb, um, and then two of the guys that were in the Art Thieves were kind of like the original guys who put bands together and promoted shows, and then we just kind of grew from there. So that the band you were in, No Response, you guys released. I, I know you did some recordings, but did you ever release an album or, or anything, an EP? Yeah, we 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 did a tape that got a lot of a lot of. Um, a lot of fans so like Dave Grohl had it um and Del Biafra wrote 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 me that he liked it 
So it got some, um, we were definitely pretty popular and we, we planned on touring and doing, you know, all that stuff and it just kind of died on us and we, uh, we just kind of, just kind of fell apart after a few years. It was interesting because you posted and then you shared it recently at a scan of the the letter that Dave Girl sent yeah. because Dave Girl actually wrote you a letter telling or just kind of asking what you've been up to and I mean when did you figure out that that letter was that Dave Girl? I don't know. I feel like I've. I, I mean, what a compliment because it's come out. He sent like letters to Ian McKay, or, you know, different people. Like it, it's interesting that he was kind of pen palling with. Yeah, I don't. I I, I somehow I, I remember. He, he he sent it to us. He sent us two letters. He sent one letter. He sent us to, to ask we would do an interview. That's the part that's missing because like, we wrote it. We wrote the interview, and we sent it back to him. So that's why that part is missing because we actually wrote the wrote the interview on that piece of paper and sent it back to him. Um, so that's missing. But that was because he he had I don't even know the history. Like he had. Um, he had cousins in Chicago that he first saw um, punk shows, and it's where he kind of discovered. In fact, Jason Narducci, who plays with um, with um, Bob Mould and Super Chunk, and just got done doing that the Murmur tour, playing REM's Murmur um, for like 40th anniversary tour. They did that. He um, he that was the first. Pr- band that Dave Grohl, a punk band that Dave Grohl had seen called Verboten, I think, so that that kind of, Dave kind of discovered punk in Chicago and then went home and kind of discovered his own stuff there, but he also stayed at my apartment in Green Bay when when he was in town with Scream, Um, so he had already kind of been to Green Bay, that would have been quite a few years after, um, because I think he would have been... 14 when he wrote me the letter so did he reference the letter when he stayed with you no i don't i i wasn't i was actually just starting my um my run of production learn you know, that summer so i know he stayed and i and i came home and they were staying there but i kind of came in and went out i never really got to know him then i didn't get to know him later he he's aware of the letter now um he i yeah if he was and i don't like i said i don't, I don't remember what when the letter became I feel like I always knew who Dave Grohl was, even when he was a scream. So that when the letter came, like I had known before, he was already kind of a rock star before, in my mind, before Nirvana and, and Foo Fighters. So I, I, I somehow I always knew that letter existed. So, well, so you ended up going to Minneapolis, and the the scene in Minneapolis. I don't know. You, you had a lot of kind of punkier bands i guess in the scene at that point what was the the difference in your your mind between minneapolis and and green bay i i went to Minneapolis. i mean minneapolis musically was at that time was was when um who's you're doing decroits and we're just i mean who's you're doing replacements were getting we're just getting their major label and for and first avenue was like really the only option for shows so it was probably the, the best time for music like that late 80s early 90s um because everybody came through and everybody played first avenue so there was um you that and that's kind of that college rock world was kind of what i i mean first avenue had this policy that usually if you went there they gave away you'd get a ticket to leave hoping that you'd come with somebody else and they would buy a ticket if the shows weren't selling well they would give away free tickets which you wouldn't get away with now but if you went to a show you'd get tickets for like two or three other shows coming up so even if it was a show that you wouldn't go to, you went, you went, you went to, if you had, if you had the time, because you, you would check them out because like I saw Gene Loves Jezebel and bands like that and bands that I normally wouldn't have gone to see, but being that I had a free ticket, it it didn't cost me anything. So I went, went and checked the bands out. So it gave me a lot of opportunities to see a lot of bands I wouldn't normally have seen. When did you decide that you wanted to, work in the music industry <clears throat> excuse me um i don't know it just kind of happened organically i mean i got one summer before i moved to minneapolis i worked here with pi who was um 
who was working with a company that still exists, um, Lighthouse, and he was fun with Adams, getting a lighting guy. And he had kind of taught me, um, it kind of showed me how to do production. And when I moved to Minneapolis, I was there for a number of years. And I became was bartending and became friends with somebody who owned a production company. So because I had that experience, I kind of jumped right in and it just kind of fell in place from there. So it was kind of like a, 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 a accident that I got into it. I was already I was already thirty when I got into um, into produ- into production and into into touring. So. It was lighting something that you you enjoyed doing, or was it just a, a placeholder for, until something else? I did enjoy it. It was different. I, I liked the creativity of it. I wasn't very good at it. I especially when it came to when I got into it, it was all analog, and, and then became digital. And I it lost me with the digital stuff and how it all worked. And I, so I was more of a tech. And I my first tours were actually lighting. I did lighting for stained. I did lighting for. Um, um, Machine Head, um, Paula Cole. So I did do some touring lighting to, to start out with, but I realized early on that I got the opportunity to tour manage and realized that I liked the energy of that much better than, and also I could I could fake that much better than I could lighting. <laughs> with, with the lighting, was it all faders? Were you sitting there doing faders the whole time? It was it was park hands. You when I first started, so it was yeah faders which was all analog, but then when it got into the digital and then you had to mirrors and, and you know, se- seconds and sweeps and all that stuff which just was, yeah, above my, uh, above my pay grade. So what, what got you moving into the, the tour manager aspect from lighting? Um, I was working for this guy named Jimmy Dale Gilmore and I was doing lights. And when, by lights, I mean, there was, I, was, I had eight, four park hands with ch- color changers on the floor, and that was it. We were playing like little, you know, two, two to five hundred capacity, you know, clubs, honky tonks, and uh, I was doing that. And my friend Eric, who I'm still friends with, who is now Wilco's tour manager, um, w- w- got the opportunity to work for another band, and so he said, "Well, do you want do you want to tour manage, and I'll, I'll show you show you how to do it and take over for me with Jimmy and." It just kind of happened like that, and Eric and I have, I took over the eels for him, I took over, um, I got him to do Lucinda Williams, a Christmas show I did in Salt Lake City, um, Wilco, now he's with them, I, I hired him to take my place on that, so we've kind of become, you know, a team in tr- trading off gigs with each other, so. It's got to be still pressure, I'm, I'm sure doing lights is pressure, but being a tour manager has got to be it's got to ramp that up quite a bit yeah and i i i want i like the energy i I, I like the energy of tour manager i like being part of um part of the bigger picture you know not just coming in and doing my lights but being part of like doing the press and and being part of the marketing and in getting that part of it, I really enjoyed that. Even though it was hard for me because I was super, I'm de- definitely an in, inter, introvert and um, super shy, and I literally had to develop a different personality to to do that. Like I would talk a lot. My my ex wife at the time um, said said that I I talk louder and I developed this like different personality. Um, when I was when I was in mature manager mode like there was a different I became a different person and, and that person eventually kind of took over but but um it was it was a struggle for me to do it because it's not my nature to be part of part of everything and be like the boss so to be the boss I had to kind of redo the way I thought and acted so which was interesting you definitely I know the pictures I've seen of you you're, you're dressed up in probably did you have to almost become more intimidating to, to get people to, to look at you more as, as like a, a leader and not a, a friend i think that part was a little bit accidental um when i was out with the black keys i, I had a friend nick who toured with nirvana in the band and and who is now with the lumineers and been to sonic youth for 20 years and he had started wearing a suit and i had always i don't know there's something we were doing saturday night live 
and I just decided I bought my whole crew suits, and and we de- we just, we decided we wanted to wear suits, and not because we had to, because we wanted to, and just kind of look a little different. And I always felt like being part of management to look that look, and it just became um, part of my my thing. Then that was a m- much later thing. That was probably in the I had already been tour managing for probably 15 years at that point when I kind of developed that um that that because because your roadies have this like stereotype of wearing sweatpants and and you know dirty t-shirts and and white tennis shoes and you know all were all black but and I just kind of wanted to feel like I was part of management that I should look that look that look you mentioned Saturday Night Live so I can't I can't not talk about that. Mm-hmm. What, what's the experience like stepping into that that place? At, you know, I'm sure you watched it back in the day. And oh it, yeah, is it easy to take something like that for granted after a while when you're walking into all these situations? I think you always realize it that um, realize that it's a special thing. Like when TV is always hard, no matter what. Like I've done all pretty much all the TV shows. I've, I've done at least once, if not. 20 30 times um and it's um it, after a while it becomes hard work but it's always that first time you do it or that you you read the history like like where um the tonight show was is in new york is like that's where conan was that's where um you know there's, there's a history of it going back to like the 50s and 60s we're in that area there's like this really cool uh closet where we used to be be the pipes that go into the building that Jim Henson did in the, in the, in the early 60s painted up to, to make it look like Muppets. You know, there's a, so much history there. Um, which right now, it's funny, there's all this controversy about um, Kelly Rowland walking off the, the Today Show set because um, there was no dressing. But those those they were, those buildings weren't made for dressing rooms. Those buildings were like, there, there's these studios in there they weren't made for these extravagant like most of these places like you go to do um the tonight show and there's like one dressing room for the bands and you, it's ha- probably half the size of this room so it's like um you know it, it, it's it's interest but they're they're in these buildings that have been around for 50 60 years they're not they're not made for for dressing rooms or to be you know the studios get bigger they have to take the space of the of the dressing rooms and they're adding more shows, so those shows need places to move to. So, you know, I understand it, but it's you also got to understand the history of where you're at too. Did you carry a camera with you around this point? I'm sure it was probably not in your interest at that point to be walking around like a tourist taking photos. Yeah, and you can't, a lot of the time you like you they 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 pro- prohibit you from doing it. Like you can you can take like of in the room um, with with your own people or maybe a shot of them on stage but they like you can't take a little of the screens you can't take over the room so they kind of stop you from 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 doing that so um you know most usually get is a picture of the sign that's it and then, and then picture of everybody in the room but that's it that's really it they kind of like keep you from ask you not to take photos so so i'm gonna guess that a lot of the shows that you did were with the the black keys a lot of the TV shows. Um, most bands do press. I think every band I did, I did at least some some TV. So, um, but I did a lot with the Black. The Black Keys got towards the end of working with them, where they didn't really want to do do with TV anymore. Um, so they only did some of it. But most bands do some kind of TV and. I've done them in multiple in multiple times too. So I, I think um, Jimmy Kimmel was the last show I did. And I've done that twice now. So that's pretty cool. And during during the taping of the show, would he be off to the the side of the stage? It depends on where where you are, on what show it is. They have different areas. Sometimes you're in a different room. Sometimes you you rarely are in the studio. Or if you're in the studio, you're the back back behind the cameras. Um, Generally, I would just walk the band in and then go back out to the hallway or to the dressing room and watch it on a, on a, um, a you know, a, a, um, a monitor. 
Uh, everybody likes to talk to you about the Black Keys. Uh, first of all, does that get old? <laughs> I mean, no. They're they're great. They're great guys and good friends. And um, I mean, honored with my time working with them was was definitely some of the the best times of of my touring career. So um, no, I don't I don't mind uh, mind talking about them. You, you did so much more than that. I mean, looking at the list yeah. of bands that, and I heard an interesting story where you were actually two days into your stint with Jerry Cantrell when Lane Stanley passed away. Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a rough and a, a weird one. It was yeah, I'd known Jerry for two days, and we were in. Um, uh, at the Sunset Marquee in Hollywood, doing having a meeting, and the, Bill Siddons, who was also the ma- ma- who was the manager of the Doors, and was the, the guy who had to get Jim Morrison's body and, fl- and deal with in Paris and deal with that, um, came up to me and stopped the stopped the meeting that we were having. Said we got to we got to move this meeting. We got to cancel it, and we'll we'll continue it later. And um, Bill came up to me and said. You're number. You're the sixth person that knows this. So we, we can't. We we're not announcing it for a couple of days until we get everybody together. Um, but they just found Lane um, in Seattle, so we had to I had to fly everybody to Susan's um, Susan Silver's house, and she was married to Chris Cornell at the time. And we had to bring everybody together and figure figure out what we're doing for memorials and. That was that was working Jerry's um, so second solo record, and that kind of put the we we still toured it another two years, but it kind of like changed what we kind of did and what we were doing for the rest of the for a good while. Do you think Allison Chains would have continued? Or, you know, do you th- yeah. The last thing with Jerry, I heard Jerry say when doing the interview was that they were. You know, he knew they would get, but he hadn't talked to Lane in a while. But they were planning on, you know, getting back together. And um, but um, yeah, it was that was that was a rough that was a rough one. Well, then also, I, from the story I heard, is you were you, you made the decision not to tell Jerry until he had some interviews coming up. Yeah, Bill had said what we were doing. I said there there was a couple big interviews that we were doing, and I knew that we wouldn't get any any more press done at least during this junket. So I said, let's just do these interviews, and I went into the interviews and kind of hid Jerry's Jerry's um, phone, so he could finish the two interviews, and then we we told him after the, after that, and that's where, um, yeah. Well, that's, I think that's pretty crazy. And like nowadays, it seems like news flies around so fast; it's so hard to hide things from anybody. Like, and I know that was only twenty years ago, but yeah, um, it's. I mean, so you did Jerry Contrell, you did Ryan Adams the eels and you mentioned machine head and suzanne vega Cinda will williams and wilco and just a, a ton of a ton of bands that you were yeah working for i mean during that time there had to be some some great stories of near accidents or you know something i don't know if you've got any stories you'd like to share i don't want to put you on the spot but i'm sure i'm sure i do i can't really think of any right now but i'm sure i um i mean i i've pr- probably some kind of story for all all of them um i've got a question for you so mm-hmm. during that time what is it like being on the inside and all of a sudden you're walking out of the venue and you see people like waiting out back to meet the band or you know did you ever do the thing that uh, i always wonder this people come out and they're like yeah the band left the band left already and they're not really gone but yeah, I mean, yeah, you do that. You, I mean, you tr- try to like clear the area for the band to do. I mean, most bands are different. Some bands like to be to have that crowd come out and take care of the the crowd when they when they come out and and sign autographs. Some want to be be kind of wait until they're 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 gone. So it depends on the band and or the group, and depends on on the, on the situation, the city, and how how. Far, but you you definitely you know whatever you you're there to make make your client comfortable, so you do whatever you, it it is that to you know keep them safe and comfortable. Do, so. you, have, do you have any run-ins with fans that were a little bit always over aggressive? Yeah, I've been chased, chased in cars, um, people trying to get on the bus. Yeah, it's, it's it's all the all the stuff. Yeah, how glamorous is the tour bus? It's like sleeping in a coffin. <laughs> with with twelve other people, or eleven other people on a bus driver. I mean, it's not. 
it's um did it take a while to get used to sleeping in one of those little beds? no you i mean i think you it's it's comfortable it's like a little you know your own little area it's it's like it's, it's literally the size of a coffin i mean it's it's that be you know you have a couple inches of, above you and a couple inches to either side of you it's a it's a tight place um but it's just it's it's what you have to do it's where you have to be so you just you get used to it and i i mean i was always comfortable i never had any issues sleeping on the bus and i was always very comfortable do that most and most people are when was the the first time you were on a tour bus what tour was it with jimmy dale gilmore my first very first tour we we were on a bus an old eagle which is a brand that doesn't exist anymore i don't think um and then we were in a bus and an rv for a while and then but pretty much most of my tours have been been buses yeah it's got to be interesting too because you're sort of at the mercy of everyone on the bus but really you're the you're the guy that's making decisions as far as yeah it's, 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 it's tough because like i tell you like you know in my position i'm the i'm the boss but then there can be you know anywhere between 10 to 100 people on the on the tour and you're 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 the boss to all those people and you're the you're the um you're you're kind of the dad to everybody and you're the and but you're living with them so you're not just like go to show up do your eight hours and leave like you're with them 24 hours a day you is in you know you're 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 living with them um you know five to 12 people you're living with on the bus that you have to see all day long so it's 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 definitely um a different different lifestyle for sure and being the tour manager i know you also mentioned in the past that you found it hard to find sleep because you were up late and you're up early to make sure that everything is working out and everything is set up i mean how yeah. did you deal with that i mean most days you go to sleep around 3 a.m and you're up between 7 and 10 so you know it's it's an 18 to 20 hour day is not out of question it was pretty regular and going sometimes two to three days without sleep was pretty much a regular occurrence also and fast forward a little bit uh you, you do you end up getting the black keys and you were with them for what 10 years seven i think seven. close so close to yeah you were with them during some pretty important times in their career they were yeah. just kind of going up to the next level and, and beyond yeah when i got the call to do them they were i would i had been doing lucinda williams for a long time and when i had called them lucinda was probably much bigger at that time than 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 they were i, I mean i took it as kind of a um i wanted to change and i was looking for another another gig and when they called i was like well I'll, I'll take that until something better and bigger comes along not thinking that it would it it turned into something that nobody not, nobody expected so that was a that was a fun time was that your first time getting into like the arena settings um i did some opening stuff for the arenas but it was the first time like going with um headlining in arenas yeah that was my that was my my i think my first time i think and that i did some smaller arenas and stuff with other artists but that was the first big arena tour how does the arena change your job as the tour manager because all of a sudden you're dealing with a bigger space and the sound is as far as what you need is different well other people take i mean each each department takes care of that so that that's but it's 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 the same you only you're doing it at a much bigger level and you and you also get more of what you want the weirdest part is a lot of times you like the the buses park in the arena so you get off you do, you know you do, you, you can sometimes go days without seeing without sunlight without seeing the day you just because you will get the bus parks up when they get there at five six seven in the morning and you you get off the bus you go to work there's no sunlight there's no windows you, you do your job and then you, you go to bed at 3 a.m. and a lot of you don't even leave the leave the buildings you drive into the buildings you drive out of the buildings you're, you're asleep when you arrive you're you're asleep when you leave so 
you don't even get to see you see all you know all the buildings kind of start looking the same after a while well and during your time with the the black keys you won the the pole star road warrior award yeah which i know you were nominated for quite a few times but how did it feel to win that award it's pretty good to be acknowledged and by my peers was pretty a pretty special time that was um that was definitely a cool a cool thing for sure and and patrick from the black keys came and presented it to me and while i was up receiving it my phone was going crazy and dan <laughs> and the old management team was calling and texting me to congratulate me because they had all they had all known already that i had won they was it was planned to have patrick there to give it to me so that was pretty and it was at the ryman which you know is like music mu- music church so it was it was a pretty special situation and does winning something like that i mean that's a big resume booster so it, after that point were you getting kind of chased after to, to do other acts um yeah i mean i was anyways because i think i was at that level with with the keys and and that you know your phone obviously rings more and and with, with your high high profile band and and so yeah so it definitely definitely helped things for sure when uh you ended with the black keys you ended up doing a, a bunch of other stuff one thing that i was curious about was little dicky because i i watched the show dave like that was it's just kind of a weird random thing like how was your time with little dicky well that, i only were <laughs> i only actually worked i only met him once i um i got hired to do that we did all the advance work and then he got he ended up getting the dave tv show and he we canceled we canceled the tour so he could do that so i got paid for doing my advance work and all that but he never i don't i don't think he's ever toured toured yet i think he the tv show um so that's so yeah he never he ended up never touring that so i met him once we, we had a meeting in l in la um me and my production manager and his manager met um at a rehearsal space in la just to check it out and, and kind of have a meeting and i met him for like 20 minutes and then they canceled a few months after that so i never really never really went anywhere well then when when covid ended up hitting <laughs> it seems like everybody in the industry kind of started doing podcasts and things to, to pass the time mm-hmm. you ended up getting married during that time which is yeah i mean that's a huge life change right there and, and you want to tell me a little bit about how meeting stacy changed your life and that whole whole time period well, besides coming moving back to green bay which was a huge thing which i swear i'd never <laughs> never do i like man but even my family goes like they thought they'd never see me here you know um but i think i think it maybe gave me a different pers- perspective on things of like not wanting to tour as much and and wanting to be home and wanting to do that um and and just kind of um slow down a little bit so. and then during the, the COVID time you probably i'm guessing enjoyed the time off really? yeah it was good I and mean, we were doing tm 101 which with me and um five or six other tour managers did uh one to tw- two times a week um a, that's still on it's a youtube series that um we did with interviewing of teach it was a teaching um podcast our webcast that we did that um taught tour management and, and just interviewed people and bands and um and, and gave instructions to um pretty much everything that it takes to to be on the road so there's like hundreds and hundreds of hours of of that that we did we did that for two years before we the pandemic ended and we got we got too busy on the road but i'm pretty proud of that that was a pretty special thing that we did well and you had a setback in, in 2020 you suffered a stroke and then you you got through that yeah and, and then you ended up getting diagnosed with parkinson's when you're out on the out on the road when you were diagnosed i wasn't i knew something was wrong i was out with with demi lovato and um i knew something wasn't right i i i tremor in my hand which i had some numbness in my left side when i when i had the stroke but i kind of recovered from that so i just assumed it was my walking was a little bit off and i was i was dealing with 
with stress like i've never dealt with stress before i like load look at my computer for hours and just not be able to like focus and and get anything done it just it was i've never been just like seized with anxiety like that and i got got myself covered and went home and went to the doctor and the doctor right away said um they said they had to do tests but they just by looking at me they're like you got parkinson's so um yeah so i've kind of been home since then i've I've, I've done a little bit of touring but for the most part i've just been staying home so when you got the diagnosis how familiar were you with with parkinson's and i'm sure since then you've done a lot of research into it i had a teacher in high school that had it i um i did not have any family or anybody that ever and now that i've got it's like everybody it seems like everybody has somebody that in their life that has it it's pretty it's pretty common but i didn't know other than the tremors and the you know i didn't know because that was one of the doctors said like he went down this list of like because i said what, what do you think it is and he's like generally there's a lot of other things that have the same symptoms as parkinson's but the doctor and the neurologist were like We'll obviously do the test, but it you know ninety nine percent you have, you have Parkinson's just your stereotype of it, and they went through the list of like swallowing, um, walking, stress, all this stuff, and it was just like a the down the list of things I was dealing with. So I was like, well, that at least tells me what what the problem is. So yeah. Well, we've got a, a couple questions here, so it might be a, a good opportunity to shift to a more positive gear. <laughs> right. uh, Bob Minter asks, do you have any souvenirs from the road besides the anxiety and the night sweats? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I have some gold records. I have um, lots of pictures, um, lots of memories, uh, lots of friendships, um, lots of friendships. Um, that was one of the best parts. Um, a lot of rec- restaurant recommendations. Um but a lot of mostly a lot of memories that you know but i don't i'm not somebody that that holds on to stuff i mean pretty much everything i own you pack in a car i don't i've never been one to like hold on to stuff so i don't have a lot of but i've i have a few a few things that i've kind of hold, held on to over the years uh, tom smith wants me to ask you about the band red scare <laughs> <laughs> well that that what I was alluding to earlier about about my band breaking up was basically, um, I think that was in Oshkosh. We played a show with, I think it was Youth Brigade and Red Scare and Red. Sc- I had a fight with a promoter who owed me some money, and the cops got involved, and um, Red Scare threatened to blackball us from ever coming to L.A. So that we that was kind of we said if we were blackballed in L.A., there's really no point of going on. So that was kind of um, the end. The end of the band was thanks to Red Scare. Tom Smith, I mean, since you've been back in Green Bay, kind of yeah, for a while now, have, have you had a chance to get your arms around the scene and, and kind of dive into some of the bands that are currently in the, in the Green Bay music scene? And do you have any opinions on on any of that? Um, I, I mean, Norman Joseph Lambert's the what are the the smart shoppers. Um, I see a lot. Of, there's there, yeah, there's a lot. Of, there's still a good music scene here. There's a lot of great, great bands. Um, I can't think of all the names, but the, um, the French. Oh, the French Irish Coalition. Irish Coalition. Um, yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, there's still a good music scene here, and thanks to Tom Johnson and Tom Smith. There's still uh, there's there's a lot of stuff to check out and 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 cool stuff coming in that even I I surprised by sometimes of the, the cool stuff that I I get to see so I try to support the scene whenever I can. Is it hard for you to go see a show and not be in somewhat of a work mode where you're looking around at things that could be improved? No, because I think <laughs> the shows that I go to here are. So, so, I mean, I I I, I certainly like. I'm there to troubleshoot if there's something going on, but 
you know they they take care of themselves i don't i don't i I, i'm not i'm not was never really a micromanager i'm more of a delegator so um i let people do their jobs unless they they ask me for help so i don't uh i just let, let usually let them do their thing you started something recently which i think is great uh jim rungy R R I R L in real life. Yeah. Which was that your wife Stacy's idea to do that, or was that something you wanted to do for a while? It was kind of her. It kind of was a. I mean, I've been kind of into into the TikTok and and, and getting into you know social media and and we'd kind of done it with um with TM one hundred and one a little bit, and then when I got sick, I kind of wanted to looking for ways to kind of keep. Um, in touch with everyone, and 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 I'm a big fan of Facebook and and keeping in touch with my friends. And also, we had another thing where we're in the last at the in the last six months to a year, we've lost a lot of friends from the scene. Um, and we had get-togethers and we had um, memorials. And people talking to it, and it was kind of like, why do we wait until that person's gone before we we say those things to them? And we we, we get together. Like I saw people at, at funerals that I hadn't seen in years, and they're coming to town. And it's like, well, why don't we try to do that before that person's not there anymore? So, I figured with my health getting bad and eventually my body slowly deteriorating. That would be a good opportunity to like celebrate my life, tell people kind of what's going on health wise, keeping in touch with people, and just developing those relationships um, um, with people and both in what's going on with me and just reminiscing and and um, touching base with 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 friends, you know. If people are interested in checking that out, that's on YouTube. Uh, the the tag or the handle, I guess. I feel old saying handle. Yeah, I know. you know better than me. It's, so it's it's, uh, it's Jim Rungy nine one one three, but you can find it probably by searching Jim Rungy yeah. in real life. Or, yeah, IRL. Yeah. So you guys have three episodes published. Plus, if people want to watch your wedding, that's up there too. Yeah, yeah. But the, I find them fascinating. Each episode's about ten to fourteen minutes, give or take. And, and you have a story which we won't talk about now. But if you want to hear about Jim, if he did or did not smoke weed with Willie Nelson, <laughs> you're going to have to go and check out the, the YouTube series. But it, so far, it's been a little heavy, you know, mixed in with, with some lighthearted stuff. And that's stuff. what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do updates on my health, but I also want to, like, like we, 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 we have input where people are kind of, like, letting it kind of develop itself and let, let people, like, I've had a lot of people that I went to high school with that are asked questions about stories, so... I'm not a big storyteller, but uh, but if somebody asks something specifically, I might, you know, talk about some stuff. What I can, what I can, what I can talk about. Um, um, I don't want it to be about name dropping, but I want it to be fun and interesting for people, and just what you know, and and celebrate the the life, and celebrate the friends, and celebrate the experiences that I've that I've had, which um, I don't take for granted. And it's interesting, I don't know if it was on the last episode, I think it was, you, you talked about putting your shirts on backwards yeah. like 80% of the time and how that's a common thing for people with Parkinson's, which I did not know. I didn't either. There's, also, too, as I talked about, there's, there's this drug that um, I also I think the, um, somebody else told me that Adderall or, or, or um, also might have the same thing, but... The doctor warned us when he before I took it. I said, I've since gone off it because I've gone off most of my drugs, which is a whole other story. But um, asking if I'd had any gambling issues in this, and one of the drugs is a side effect that just caused you to to become a gambling addict, in any uncontrol not be able to control that. Which I guess it makes sense that it's you know um, the. So it's almost it makes you more compulsive, kind of. Yeah, but but it means it, it it stirs the dope. I mean, it it kind of makes sense when you think about it that gambling would would stir up the dopamine, like which is what 
Parkinson's is is a depletion of your your dopamine. But in but it's the weird part of it is, is this this drug specifically targets gambling. It's it's not as far as I know. There's not anything else that it triggers, but except gambling. And there's a, a radio lab did a great. Um, I just have, we came across a. Um, a show they did it about about this specifically and a woman went through like three hundred thousand dollars in a year of gambling and when she went off the drug it stopped immediately so it's that like that powerful like to do it that it just like you know you're a gambling addict you're you don't have any compulsion at all so it's just strange how it works like that Looks like I neglected some questions here, Jim. So we'll we'll get to these. Uh, Dustin Pixley, thanks. He said, "What's more punk than being banned in L.A.?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, Megan Holland, uh, thank you for the the question. He want she wants to know if you've ever been on the set of Austin City Limits. Oh, both 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 um, hundreds of times, and both um, as a fan and as a working person. There's the the old the old studio that's on college campus and. The, um, UT campus, and then the new one now, which is, in, you know, it's funny that that's an interesting story. Is that you, for years I watched it from when I was a kid when it was on PBS, and I'd watch it, and I always thought, based on how it looked, that it was on top of a building overlooking the city, but that's just like plastic. It's like made up to look like the city. It's not the city at all. It's just, it's in a s- small little studio. With just this backdrop that look makes it look like you're overlooking Austin, but you're actually not even close to downtown Austin. So, yeah, that was always that interesting. But yeah, I've I've seen so many cool things at at the ACL Studios. Yeah, have you ever thought about writing a book, Jim? I'm sure you get asked that all the time. Yes, and I. I mean, like a tell-all book. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that I. There, there's guys that have more to tell than I do, but it's also why we kind of wanted to do this video um, series. Is I think I one I don't know if I have the time or the the stamina to do that now, but it does offer me the opportunity to tell stories and and talk about it versus writing it down. So hopefully. I'm finding the alternative to that that's not as take, taking up as much of my time. So, question on the industry: How do you feel? I AI is how do you feel AI is going to affect the industry? Because it seems like they're trying to get AI to do more and more. I mean, what isn't what isn't it going to affect? I mean, I think it, it's all of our lives. Although. It seems like everything a year ago it seemed like it was going to take over our lives and now it's kind of not taking over our lives so I mean I think they're controlling it more but um I don't I mean it's hard to say it, it, who who would have thought that it would be, be even as far as it's gone now so it's 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 anybody's guess you know what it's going to become and what it's going to what it's going to do and from all from from the creative side to the you know business side so i'd like to ask you jim about tour managing people have to ask you all the time how do you get into it like i want to get into that that looks so cool what do i have to do and it's probably not as easy as people think it is no it's 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 not but um you know just it just takes time and you just it's opportunities it's just really taking advantage of opportunities and working your ass off which is why tm 101 we go through that a lot so how to get into it and you know so that that's the biggest thing i think that's a huge um uh, op- opportunity to, to to learn how to what what the job is how to get involved what to do like working with for promoters running running um you know just working with your your friend's band um you know just taking advantage of every every situation that you can you know i never expected to be in that position to get the opportunities that i did so it's it's hard to say like you know i used to say like you know instead of going right going left you know take taking advantage of the situations and just kind of going with it and seeing where what it where it takes you and seeing what that next situation is you know 
just not being afraid. Well, and when you actually started doing the job, what were some of the things that were different about the job than you thought before you started the job? Well, for one thing, with technology, I, I'd never really worked with computers. And I mean, I worked with a, with a legal pad and a pager. You know, there's no cell phones or no computers. Um, I was doing it a few years. I mean, it, pretty early on, those became something, but I've been doing it that long that those those were new things to to the industry but um what was the question again the the things that were different oh. from after you started the job than before you thought i don't know there were i think i'd, I'd been around it enough that i think that it there weren't a lot of surprises i mean i think just the i've had to keep up with the technology and with stuff like that like i think just like anything as the world changes technology changes and and the the way you do things changes like dealing with um you know and, and as things grow from obviously doing an arena to doing a club things are you know a lot of a lot of it's the same the structure's the same but the 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 what you do and who who you work with and number of people is you know changes greatly so well as far as the the stress of the job so you're one of the I think one of the things that you had to do as a tour manager is schedule everybody's flights or their transportation. Yeah, logistics is a big, big thing. Yeah. I mean, how often did did a wrench get thrown in there, or all of a sudden, you know, at the last second, something comes up? I think you go and yeah, I think I think you think a little bit differently because you you go to that you always expect there's going to be something, a wrench thrown into it, and you just prepare for, for that. You have a good travel agent, so the tra- you you have good people around you that you're always ready for those things. You're always ready for for flights being canceled and that's why you don't you don't fly people in the day of show you fly them in the night before to, that way if, if there is a canceled flight they don't miss the miss the show like you just learn certain things that that um you just need to be aware of um and be, be prepared for you know just always you know make advance it's all about advancing making sure checking with the hotel a couple of times to make sure that they have all the rooms that you needed and it's all about just being prepared and you mentioned you've pretty much done every every one of the tv shows as far as festivals you've pretty much done all those as well so i mean pretty much yeah as far as compared doing like arenas to a festival like how is that different i'm, I'm assuming there's just a ton more moving pieces more egos it, it depends i mean you you get obviously if you're headlining you're getting treated better than if you're you know open to playing during the day and opening it up but um yeah i mean festivals can really they can be great but they can really suck too there's again it's just about advancing the hell out of it being prepared knowing what you can and can't get away with and do um and, and just you know advancing and making sure that you're covered on in everything and you know what you're walking into uh during your career as a tour manager did you get sick of people asking you for tickets <laughs> um i mean yes and no i mean you just say no if you can't do it i just i wouldn't make a big deal of it as either i can or i can't and i didn't really you know um yeah i i help people i want to get a lot i would ask people like we we played milwaukee years ago and the show wasn't selling that great and they were going to paper which is which is like giving away tickets to make the room look bigger and i was like you know, I, I'm from there. Can I do it? And I ended up thinking I had a guess of like 250 people. Like pretty much, it, was, it actually split the arena. It was the, it was not the new arena. It was the old arena in Milwaukee. And I think I had 125 people. One side was 100, 100 plus people of people I went to high school with. And the other side was 100 people from the music scene like that were on the other other side of the, the arena. So I had the pretty much... The whole um, lower stands was all my friends, <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was a lot of fun. Did you have instances where there was fans that were trying to identify you and use you to get back stage by the bands? Um, no, because I don't think anybody would that would try that with would would think that that would work. So they'd pro- <laughs> they'd probably try that with other people, but not me. You mentioned 
uh, somewhere else that the descendants were using Green Bay as well as a home base. Can you tell me some descendant stories? I know you're friends with those guys. Did you hear the song that Stephen Stephen wrote? No. He he was his, um, it was just a couple. It was during the snowstorm because he lives in when I'm. He's the only one I'm really in touch with a lot. We talk we talk quite a bit. He's a great he's a great guy. He's a guitar player, and we've been friends for. Well, they used to. So everybody stayed at my place in Minneapolis, and he. We've been friends since the since the early '80s, and uh, but yeah, him and his he had posted on on um, Facebook that he needed a he didn't have a wine they they were stuck stuck at home because of the snowstorm and they didn't have a wine opener, so I told him that somebody had told him a trick about using a screwdriver and a hammer, and I said, well. What I use is a sharpie in a, in a in a shoe, and he actually wrote a song and included me into it, which is which is great. It's it's online. It's pretty it's pretty great. He mentions mentions me a bunch of times. That's it. So the it's interesting. What what year were they using Green Bay as their their satellite? Well, location? it was it was it was the early '80s, but it it honestly wasn't. Descendants were just a few times because it, it was. Um, well, Milo was in school, so it was actually all more so than than Descendant, but which was everybody but Milo. So, um, I guess it was more all than Descendants. But um, they used to come every summer. A lot, a lot of bands did. Like No No Effects did the same thing. Like they'd they'd come to Green Bay and do shows, and just set satellite out of here or play here instead of um, Madison or Milwaukee or Chicago. We've we've got a, a calling question. You are on the air with Jim Murray. What's your question? Hi, this is Ike Aromba here, and my question for Mister Rungi is: uh, Who's the biggest jerk you ever had to work with in the music industry, and why? And who was the probably the nicest person you ever had to work with in the music industry, and why? Boy, that's a tough one. I. Um Putting you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say I, 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 I've dealt with people that were difficult, but I wouldn't say jerks. But they just wanted what they wanted, and and um, I worked with some people that were like tough, that wanted specific, wanted things in a certain way. But I wouldn't. I, I got along with her. Like I worked for Ricky Lee Jones for years, and she was tough, but she's one of the. But it was one of the best shows, and and. One of my my favorite people um, ever. Um, I don't. I'm sure. I'm sure there were some jerks, but I don't really can't really think. Best one there, there's. There's so many. I mean, obviously, my days with the Black Keys were great, just because that was such an experience of of headlining and um, growing with them, like them. You know, just being out of the van, just a few, a few, even though they'd been a band for a while, but they were still, they were indie. They were still touring in a, you know, van until recently. They hadn't been in a bus that long. And, and when I started with them, there were, there were six of us and we put all the gear in the bay. And by the time we were done, we were like 10 trucks and 100 crew people, you know, went in the six or seven years grew that much. You know, so that was a pretty, um, and I'm still a good friend. I just saw them in Milwaukee recently and hung out with them and still friends with both of them, and especially Patrick. Patrick and I talk all the time. So we're, we're pretty tight. So it sounds like to answer Ike's question, I mean, they're really, it, it's few and far between. I mean, with the, the jerk stuff, you probably just let it roll off your shoulders. And- yeah, people are people. I mean, I think, I don't, I mean, I don't know that I've ever, I'm, I'm sure as soon as, I leave. I can go like, oh, I forgot about that person was a was a jerk. But I don't. I, as far as people that I work with, I mean, there are probably people that I didn't like. Scott Stab from Creed was not a jerk, but just kind of like snobby. But I wouldn't say you know. But I wouldn't say he was a bad guy. Just we didn't. He didn't really like hang out, you know, with us. Um, but as far as somebody being an asshole, I didn't really deal with that much. Thanks for the question, Ike. If anybody else has a question, give us a call. I, Dan Rather, I was fascinated to hear that you were hanging around Dan Rather. I mean, anybody that grew up 
you know, in the eighties and nineties and before familiar with Dan Rather is well, he's a man. he's a Texas guy. It, it it is when it is kind of when you think about it without the knowing stuff about him, which he's a big music fan and he's a big Texas guy and he's a big Texas music fan. So Jimmy Dale Gilmore and that Joe Ely and and Butch Hancock and Willie Nelson and that world was um, they were. Um, Kind of they they were part of that Texas world, which which Dan Rather was a big fan of. So, um, you know, we just happened to be in New York, and, and Dan Rather living in New York, and he would just come out and hang out with us when we were in, when we were in town. You know, just probably hanging out with him and hearing him talk was a trip. <laughs> yeah, and then that happened. I mean, that's one of the cool things about doing this is you, there's so many people like the the situations I've been in. You know, um, my you know my friend. Dakota Johnson um, was what was hanging out with when I was with the Black Keys, and my my son, who's like fourteen now, um, was like seven or eight then, and he was like he was it was like Aunt Dakota, you know. They, she was she was always around, and they were they had a thing with each other, you know. It's just weird little things that happen that you wouldn't expect, you know, in your normal life that just you you kind of just get used to with the weirdness of it you know this is kind of a a strange question jim but when you're talking to uh some of the artists you worked with do you ever pitch coming to green bay or appleton and passing kind of like you guys should check out like the rush center or the appleton performing arts center i don't really ever have i mean that's not that that stuff is booked it's usually booked and then i go from there i mean i do it in a small level on your friends like like I got the Dead Boys to, you know, convince Cheetah to come here because Cheetah Chrome is a good friend of mine, and and got him to play, you know, at 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 the Lyric Room when it was still open. Um, so you know things like that I'll I'll recommend. But for the most part, the agents take care of that. We don't have any real say into that. Um, for the most part, you know, so that that's kind of given to us after it after it's over. You know, then we get the, the we we just deal with what they book. You know, we don't have a lot of say in it. Have you had a chance to see a show at the UFO gift shop museum or the Tarleton? Tarleton, I've been to a few times. I don't. Um, yeah, or we yeah we saw. I forget who it would Tom Smith would know who it was, but I've seen a couple of shows there. Um, UFO, I've been there a few times, but I don't think I've been to a show there yet. And then, in, as far as the Appleton music scene, do you ever come down to Mile of Music or anything? That's I've happened? never been. I don't. I don't know much about Mile of Music. I met Corey, Corey Chiz just um, recently. Um, well, a couple a couple years ago now at a at a Steve Earle concert. We were both friends with the guys in Steve Earle's band, and and we got to to um, meet, and we talk online every once in a while a little bit. But that's um, um, he likes stuff that I write or something like that. But but um, I don't know much about about I, something I've always wanted to get to, but I've never. I, usually, I've been working to, while that's going on. I'm working, so it's like I don't get the opportunity to check it out. Uh, Green Bay Blah has been getting worked on, as you mentioned, for ten years. Do you have any insight? I know you're an executive uh, producer. producer, only because I gave him the most money. <laughs> that's how the world works, though. So you're the executive producer. Do you have any insight as to when when they plan on wrapping that up? I heard soon. I mean, I've heard this a few times, but I, I um, had dinner with Jim Baker just a few months ago, and he said that they're working on it. They've said the last couple summers it would be ready this summer, so I'm hoping one of these summers they're right <laughs> about it. But um, that's it for people that aren't aware. That is the detail detailing the the beginning history of Green Bay Punk and yeah. the scene there. And you've sat down for a lot of interviews for this. I think they interviewed me for two, twice for like six hours or something like that. So they have so much. I don't know. I think I think that's the biggest problem. Is I heard they have like four hundred hours worth of <laughs> worth of stuff and try to mix that all down to like an hour or two is going to be insurmountable. So I don't. I but I but I think they're slowly getting there. They they've both had some things that life things that they've had to deal with. But I they tell me that they're they're working on it and getting it out so 
we're waiting because my my band was supposed to do a reunion show at the UFO Fest this year, but now we're not because my drummer can't. Um, he's got some, mother's got some health issues, so he can't do it. But the other one we're doing is we're supposed to get together for the um, opening of the of the documentary. So we're kind of waiting to hear on that too if we're going to do that. Is it kind of hard when you? You know these guys are working on the, this documentary. It's hard to figure out who who do you include in this because obviously people are in different scenes and everybody thinks that their scene is like the scene. So I mean, you you came up in a, in a scene in Green Bay that where there are other pockets of people that are all of a sudden, he, and they, the people working on the documentary would probably know more. But all of a sudden, yeah. But I think I I mean I think the reason they did it and, and I think anybody that was around then knows that that was a pretty special. I mean, we're. I mean, here we are, forty years later, and we're still. M- most of us are still friends, and we we've been doing a Christmas party for ten years now, and you know, hundred people show up, or or more every year. Um, so there's still a a closeness there, and a friendship, and a relationship that's that that we've all continued, and um, so I think that. As far as that, I think that's one of the reasons because there's been a lot of movies done about scenes in different cities. Although I don't know if there's been one done about a place as small as Green Bay, but I think that um, the people that were the bands that came through and the people that went to the shows realized there was something special about you know doing shows in Green Bay. Looking back over your career, is there one specific? event one one show that you were working on that that was the best peak of of your career as a tour manager probably headlining coachella with the black keys was was pretty special um there's probably been other that's kind of the easy answer i'm sure there were other other um like i remember doing a show with ricky lee jones in paris with I always forget the name of there, but he's a pretty big artist in in Paris. But they did Beatles songs, and I've never been a Beatles fan. But being a fan of the, but hearing those songs done by Ricky Lee Jones and this French artist in a coffee shop, like put those songs at a whole different level in a, in a place for me. So that I've definitely, you know, forgotten more than I remember the, of magical times like that. You know, so. Well, again, I want to suggest to everyone go check out your YouTube channel. It's it's great content, and find Thank out you. if you smoked weed with Willie Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's again, it's it's a little lighthearted. It's a little heavy, so it's a little bit of both. And, and we're still trying to figure out what it's going to be when it grows up, but we're we're it's a work in progress for sure. And but yeah, anybody, please share it. Please um, subscribe to it. And, um, check it out. We're trying to do at least do it once a week if not more once or twice a week so um and we'd rather not to make it too long and we we take questions we want to, uh, want to talk about we talk about how i'm developing with my parkinson's and kind of what i've done with my life and my career and then you know we ask people to ask questions or you know about anything about you know we talk about tm 101 and be, becoming a tour manager and what that is and there's really nothing off the table you know I'm doing dealing with my life and my experiences. And currently, Stacy's behind the camera. Is she any plans that she's going to come in front of the camera? I don't know. We just kind of developed it that way to make it. I want her to be a part of it, but making it about about that dynamic is. Uh, so we're not sure yet. <laughs> yeah, we're not. Is we're still we're still we're still figuring. We're, we're taking suggestions. So I, I like when I'm watching the videos. I, I like to try to see what books are on the bookshelf behind you. <laughs> so I, <laughs> But yeah, so again, that if the handle is Jim Rungy nine one one three on YouTube, or just do a search Jim Rungy in real life, yep. and you'll you'll find it. So, Jim, thank you for all you've done for oh, the scene. Thank, thank you, you for doing the show. Uh, come back anytime you want. Thank and, you, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And we look forward to Green Bay Blah whenever that comes out. Yep. Thank you for being an executive producer. <laughs> sure, my my pleasure. <laughs> thank God I had the money when it, when it, when they were going through it at the time.